So I said, fine. And I did a house for him, a modern house, very open plan, brick up to the second floor window sills. This is the first time I did that. And wood above that. And they loved it. And they lived in it for a good many years. But Meyer considered the William Zale home as a breakthrough for his career. Mrs. Zale wanted a house at the corner of Douglas and Beverly. So I designed her a colonialish kind of house. And I couldn't get any enthusiasm out of her. So I thought, oh, well, I'm going to spread my wings a little bit. And I made her a sketch, and it's the house that they have now. And it's the prototype of my own house. And she fell for it immediately. For Dallas in the late 30s, it was a bold departure from the traditional, incorporating many of his favorite design themes, redwood over brick exterior, corner windows, and an open floor plan. As she would throughout her husband's career, Sean Meyer collaborated on the interior design. Designed everything that was designable in the house. Furniture, light fixtures, and the whole house made immediate impression on the whole Zale family and the Lipschies and all the people I did successive houses for. Meyer was developing a following, particularly among leaders of the city's Jewish community. In the years leading up to World War II, he designed synagogues in Tyler and for the congregation of Teferet Israel in Dallas. During the same period, he designed more than a dozen homes most of them incorporating modern themes, brand new to the area. The houses that he was doing in the late 30s, his own house in the early 40s, was very clear expressions of a new aesthetic that was not here before. Until the early 50s, I'd say he was the really only serious modern architect in Dallas. During World War II, Meyer signed up. He was assigned to travel the country, designing military housing for the Army. During one of his furloughs, Meyer had the chance to visit Taliesin, the Wisconsin summer home of Frank Lloyd Wright. Wright's influence would surface in many of Meyer's post-war designs. By the mid-40s, there were two dominant strains in American architecture. One of them is the so-called organic line that comes from Frank Lloyd Wright and had its impact on people like Bruce Goff and O'Neill Ford as well. And the other line is the sort of international model, modern glass box line that came from Corbusier and on through Gropius and Mies van der Rohe. Uh, the interesting, one of the interesting things, I think, about Howard's career is that those two strains come together in the work of one architect. The first building that he did in Jamaica and New York is a classic little Kabu house. And the houses that he was doing, certainly in the late 40s, are very much in the Frank Lloyd Wright mode. I think of the two influences, Frank Lloyd Wright clearly won out. I'm sure that if I'd stayed in New York, the influences would have been all the European modernists, and possibly Frank Lloyd Wright. Coming here added the Southwest influence, the same influence that uh, exerted itself upon Dave Williams and Neil Ford. In Texas, Meyer had generous spaces to work with. There were hot summers that demanded protection from the sun and mild winters that invited the merging of interior and exterior spaces. There was a less formal lifestyle that suggested a softer and wider range of materials to be used. But there's no question but that the local scene and the local requirements influence the design. They're not Texas houses in any sort of a narrow, se sentimental, or nostalgic way. Harry is a much more austere and abstract architect than people like David Williams or O'Neill Ford but they do belong to this place. Here you started out as a modernist, as a devotee of Corbusier, and I don't think you've ever really swerved from that in your mm -hmm. whole career, and yet you have a building like this with these trees and these gardens and this concern for shade and this lovely brick. It's like 
as you grew older, you became more of a Texas architect, is it? <laughs> very possibly. He's not a regionalist in any sort of narrow sense, any sort of very strict sense. He's, he's a regionalist only in the sense who somebody who, who found a way successfully to make modernism come to terms with Texas. The demand for Meyer's Texas modernism began to grow, as did the size of commissions. He continued to do what he had been doing on a somewhat larger and more ambitious scale, but there's something fundamental about his palette of materials, his colors, a kind of discretion and an intimacy in the work that never really went away. So that even when you're in a, a building like 3525, it's a very large building, and yet there's a quietness to it, a kind of discretion, an understatement to it. And I think that's basically what his architecture has always been about. 3525 Turtle Creek Boulevard, a prestigious Dallas address. Made of concrete and Mexican brick, Meyer drew 22 luxurious stories wrapped around a central core elevator. This tightly organized, Wrightian pinwheel design saves steps for its patrons, and latticed screens of carefully detailed concrete keep the hot Texas sun at bay, while also providing human scale. But by 1960, Meyer's interests flowed far beyond the pinwheel luxury of Turtle Creek. Public housing was born with the modern movement and has always been a, a, an important uh, tenet of uh, modern architectural thinking. So that the opportunity to do it here fell right into line. The homes Meyer built during the last half century are still treasured by clients who prefer crisp, understated design to architectural flamboyance. And his major buildings, like 3525 Turtle Creek and Temple Emmanuel, are now recognized as architectural landmarks. The best of his houses and the best of his public buildings have a warmth and a richness that we don't ordinarily associate with modern architecture. He was able to design spaces that are very comfortable to be in. I think they're houses that are made with great affection for the owners, for the spaces, for the materials, and I think that comes through. It's about how things go together. It's about the quiet pleasures of craftsmanship, of materials joining one another perfectly. The best example of, of, of that concern is, um, is Temple Emmanuel. I think it's uh, one of the best, if not the best, architect-artist collaborations in this part of the country. The new temple would be built in far north Dallas. Meyer and fellow architect Max Sanfield, both temple members, were chosen after conversations with noted architect Eric Mendelson fell through. William Worcester, dean of the University of California Architecture School, would consult. When they chose Max and me to be architects, it was with the understanding that we would have a consultant. We were just local boys, you see. I had admired Worcester's work. I called Worcester. He was very amenable to coming. So the next day, we presented Bill to the building committee, and they bought him hook, line, and sinker without any trouble. George Kepish of MIT headed a distinguished group of artists who would work on the project. It would be a collaborative effort throughout. Such collaborations are usually disastrous because the architect and the artist tend to speak different languages and they tend to have their own separate provinces and uh, never the two come together. But I think in Temple Emmanuel you see a very, very wonderful uh, fusion of architecture and art. Meyer credits Worcester with the atrium site plan, which worked so well on the undeveloped land. It's sitting on this flat prairie, and yet there's a wonderful sequence of spaces of entry and exit. You have sanctuary, you have exterior gardens, you have chapel, you have a wonderful interplay between different kinds of spaces and between the, the building and the exterior spaces. All the materials are the ones he's used before, that soft Mexican brick, that kind of very soft fawn-colored concrete. There is a very real integration between the art and the architecture here. How do you get architects and artists 
to work together the way they did here. Fortunately, Kepish caught the spirit of what we were doing, chose as his collaborators, a man like Filipovsky, a lovely lady like Annie Albers, and then contributed so much of his own great artistry. One of the things that astonishes me about this place always is just on the one hand, it's such a huge space, and yet it feels so intimate and so small. The thing that gives it scale is the light fixtures. They tell you the size of the space because they help to fill it. Mm -hmm. The centerpiece of Kepish's artistic contribution was the large main wall of the sanctuary facing the congregation. We had uh, gone through all sorts of paces on what to do with this wall. Kepish considered many treatments before coming up with the solution. Sculptor Octavio Medean would embed small reflective mosaic tiles in the mortar joints between the bricks, forming a seven-branch candlestick, the menorah. He set the, 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 the bits of glass in the joints of this rather than attaching them to the surface. It integrates the decoration with the structure. There was a spirit all the way through that everything we touched must be looked at carefully and only permitted to go into work when everybody was satisfied with it. In many instances, we had to refute what the building committee sought. The whole business of the lighting in here, when we talked first about six great chandeliers, uh, that met with, with some questioning. Mm -hmm. And then when we said, well, if you don't like six, we're going to give you 44. <laughs> it's such a superb integration of architecture and art. Uh, it's a very humane, civilized building, not overstated, a wonderful place to be. It had a level of sophistication and I think a, a kind of wholeness about it that we hadn't seen very often. So I think in that respect, it's also a model for other architects to look at. I think it's his most ambitious project and I think on balance, the most fully realized project. An uncompromising quest for quality. The temple remains a stunning tribute to the life and work of Howard Meyer. It has a certain timeless quality to it that I think all well-made things finally do. And that's really what you're dealing with, a well-made object. and she fell for it immediately. For Dallas in the late 30s, it was a bold departure from the traditional, incorporating many of his favorite design themes, redwood over brick exterior, corner windows, and an open floor plan. As she would throughout her husband's career, Sean Meyer collaborated on the interior design. Designed everything that was designable in the house, furniture, light fixtures, and the whole house made immediate impression on the whole Zale family and the Lipschies and all the people I did successive houses for. Meyer was developing a following, particularly among leaders of the city's Jewish community, 
In the years leading up to World War II, he designed synagogues in Tyler and for the congregation of Teferit. So I said, fine. And I did a house for him, a modern house, very open plan, brick up to the second floor window sills. This is the first time I did that. And wood above that. And they loved it. And they lived in it for a good many years. But Meyer considered the William Zale home as a breakthrough for his career. Mrs. Zale wanted a house at the corner of Douglas and Beverly. So I designed her a colonialish kind of house. And I couldn't get any enthusiasm out of her. So I thought, oh, well, I'm going to spread my wings a little bit. And I made her a sketch, and it's the house that they have now, and it's the prototype of my own house. Israel in Dallas. During the same period, he designed more than a dozen homes, most of them incorporating modern themes, brand new to the area. The houses that he was doing in the late 30s, his own house in the early 40s, was very clear expressions of a new aesthetic that was not here before. 